Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today I'm back in my regular studio having a look at a spintheroscope. Now, before I get started, I do want to give a huge shout out to my viewer, Muonium. Now, as you'll recall, when I did my Cabinet of Curiosities wish list video, I mentioned that I wanted to cover a spintheroscope, but was having difficulty finding one. Well, Muonium directed me towards the wonderful website United Nuclear, which sells an affordable modern version. So thank you so much. It's really viewers like you that make this channel possible. So the spintheroscope was invented in 1903 by British scientist Sir William Crookes, and we've talked about Crookes before in my video on the radiometer, and he really was a prolific and extremely important scientist. Among his many achievements was discovering the element thallium and inventing a very sensitive vacuum balance that allowed him to measure its atomic weight. But what he's most remembered for is inventing the cathode ray tube, which led to the development of a number of important technologies, including x-rays, television, and tube electronics. Now, as the story goes, in 1903, Crookes is experimenting with the then newly discovered element radium in the form of radium bromide, when he accidentally spilled some on his lab bench. Now, given that this is one of the rarest and most expensive substances known to man at the time, he was determined to collect every last grain. So he pulled out a microscope and started looking over his bench. Now, as it happened, he had spilled the radium onto a screen that had been treated with zinc sulfide. And as he searched for the grains, he noticed that every time the radium emitted an alpha particle, it caused the screen to emit a tiny green flash. And so he invented the spintheroscope to take advantage of this phenomenon. Now, this is really a simple little device. It's got a radioactive source inside. Crookes used radium, but modern ones typically use americium-241 or a thorium ore, like in this one, it's probably mosinite. And then in front of that is a zinc sulfide screen and then a magnifying optic that can be adjusted for focus. And when you look inside, you can see these little green flashes of light as alpha particles hit the screen. Now, I was going to demonstrate this to you, I actually put up the camera and show you what it looks like, but unfortunately the flashes are so faint, you actually need to adapt your eyes to total darkness for 10 to 15 minutes before you can see anything. And I just don't have a camera sensitive enough to actually pick it up. So you're going to have to do with this artist's representation of what it looks like or go pick one up for yourself and have a look. It's actually pretty cool. So the spintheroscope is actually very short-lived as a scientific instrument. In fact, it really only ever was a laboratory curiosity, but it did experience a resurgence in popularity as a children's toy in the late 1940s, early 1950s during the mid-century atomic power craze. And one of the most famous examples was marketed by Kick Serial starting in 1947. And you know, you would, mail in your box top and your 15 cents and you would get it in the mail. And it was this little plastic ring with this atomic bomb shaped canister on top with a little window and you could look into it and see the little flashes of green light. But despite the fact that it was an atomic toy and it was atomic bomb shaped, uh, the marketing and the branding was all related to the Lone Ranger for some reason, which I suppose makes it the most 1950s object ever created. So despite being relatively short-lived as a scientific instrument, the spintheroscope, or more specifically the zinc sulfide fluoroscope screen inside, was used in a number of important scientific experiments, the most famous of which being the gold foil experiments conducted between 1908 and 1913 by Ernest Rutherford, Ernest Marsden, and Hans Geiger. And at the time, the standard model of the atom that was being used by scientists was called the plum pudding model. And this had been put forward by J.J. Thompson, the discoverer of the electron. And this held that the atom was like this you know, undifferentiated clump of positive charge with electrons embedded in it like raisins in a plum pudding, hence the name. And this was what Rutherford and his colleagues were attempting to test. So what they did was they used a radioactive source to fire alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold that had been beaten down to only a couple of atoms in thickness. And this was surrounded by a zinc sulfide screen that reached almost all the way to the rear. Now what they were expecting was that if the atom really was this sort of you know, nebulous cloud of charge, the alpha particles would just pass right through it and be detected at the opposite end of the screen. But what they found through countless hours of very painstaking observation was once in a while, 
the alpha particles would be deflected left and right, and sometimes would actually bounce back and hit the rear of the screen. And this was shocking. Uh, Rutherford described it as being like firing a navel shell at a piece of tissue paper and having it bounce back. What it indicated was that the atom actually had a very hard core, a dense core, the nucleus, that was deflecting the particles whenever they hit. And this revolutionized our understanding of atomic physics, and it created the groundwork for nuclear physics to come. So it was a very important discovery. So the spintharoscope was the first instrument capable of directly detecting radioactivity in real time. But you'll notice that it was invented quite a few years after the actual discovery of radioactivity. So how do scientists like Mappy and Pierre Curie detect and measure radioactivity in order to make their discoveries? Well, they would have used something called a quadrant electrometer, and this is a device for measuring extremely small electric charges. And how this works is you have this sort of propeller-shaped device suspended on a very fine wire inside a chamber to protect it from stray air currents. And inside the chamber, you have four charged plates, the quadrants, which bathe the veins in a steady electric field. Now, when you apply any sort of electric charge to the wire in the veins, it creates a charge imbalance that causes the veins to rotate ever so slightly. And how you measure this is there's a mirror attached to the veins, and you shine a beam of light onto this mirror and then onto a large circular scale effectively creating a long weightless pointer. Longer the pointer, the greater the deflection, the more sensitive the instrument. And the Curies actually developed their own even more sensitive version of this called the quartz fiber electrometer. And this is based on a phenomenon that Pierre Curie and his brother Jacques had discovered in 1880 called piezoelectricity. And this is the phenomenon whereby if you crush or bend a quartz crystal, it produces an electric charge. And vice versa, if you apply an electric charge to a piece of quartz, it will deflect. And this is actually the principle behind a barbecue igniter. So when you squeeze the trigger, you're actually crushing a little piece of quartz, which is producing a charge that then jumps across a gap to produce a spark. The spark ignites the gas. In reverse, it's also the principle behind a quartz watch. So inside a watch, a little canister is a very thin slice of quartz and a current is applied to it, causing the quartz to oscillate at a very regular frequency, and this drives the rest of the watch movement. So in the Curie's experiments, the electrometer would be connected to something called an ion chamber, which is a container of either ambient or low-pressure gas. And when an alpha, beta, or gamma ray passes through the gas, it ionizes it, it strips electrons off, and this creates a charge which is then collected and measured by the electrometer. And the longer the chamber is exposed to radioactivity, the more charge accumulates at a rate proportional to the decay rate or the emission rate of the radioactive element. And this is the principle of operation behind the quartz fiber or ion chamber dissimeter, which I have covered in a previous video. It's also how a smoke detector works. So in a smoke detector is a little ion chamber that's open to the ambient air. And inside are two parallel plates with an electric charge applied across them. There's also a little pellet of the isotope americium-241, and the alpha particles produced by this ionize the gas inside the chamber and create a zone of a particular electrical resistance. Now, when smoke particles get into the chamber, if there's a fire, uh, this changes the resistance between the two plates, and this change is registered by the circuit, and it sounds the alarm. So there you go, a you know, domestic application of an ion chamber. So using an ion chamber, the Curies were able to demonstrate, for example, that the radioactivity of a piece of pitch blend, a type of uranium ore, was higher when it contained a larger proportion of uranium, indicating that radioactivity was a property inherent to a specific type of element, specific type of atom. They're also able to show that the total radioactivity given off by a piece of pitch blend uh, could not be accounted for solely by the content of uranium, indicating that there were other undiscovered elements in the ore. And this then led to the discovery of the elements radium and polonium. So while the ion chamber and the electrometer were the first instruments capable of measuring radioactivity quantitatively, they weren't the first to be able to detect it in the first place. Uh, that honor actually belongs to regular photographic film, 
and that's actually how radioactivity was first discovered. So in 1896, French scientist Henri Becquerel absentmindedly left some samples of uranium salt on some wrapped photographic plates in his desk drawer and then left for the weekend. When he came back and developed the plates, he found that somehow they had been exposed. In fact, they had preserved a perfect outline of the clumps of salt that he'd left on top of them. Now, since the plates were wrapped in opaque paper, uh, Becquerel deduced that the salts must be giving off some sort of invisible ray, much like the X-rays discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen the year before, that were capable of penetrating the paper and exposing the emulsion. And indeed, we still use photographic film in X-ray machines and film badge decimeters to this day. And photographic film was also involved in an incident that led to the accidental civilian discovery of the first atomic bomb test. So in July 1945, the Kodak headquarters in Rochester, New York, started receiving complaints that this highly sensitive X-ray film that they were producing was contaminated. It was covered in spots and fogging, and it was unusable. Now, the manufacturing process had been specially designed to exclude this type of contamination, especially from radium, which was used for clock dials and the like, and so they investigated immediately. They found that the problem was actually with the packaging, with the cardboard boxes that the film came in, and these boxes had been manufactured by paper mills located in Iowa and Indiana, both of which were located beside rivers. And through quite a bit of ingenious deduction, including realizing that the main contaminant was cerium-141, which was a very common fission product, they deduced that the contamination had actually come from somewhere in the southwestern United States and had traveled through the air and then been carried down into the rivers through rainfall and then been used in the manufacturing process of the boxes and ended up contaminating the film. And this was, of course, the Trinity test, the world's first nuclear detonation, which was conducted on July 16th, 1945, in Alamogordo, New Mexico. So all the instruments I've mentioned thus far were able to either detect radioactivity directly, but not measure it quantitatively, or the other way around. And the first instrument capable of doing both together was developed in 1908. And this was the Geiger-Muller tube, which was invented by Hans Geiger, who we mentioned before. And of course, this is the key component of what we currently refer to as a Geiger counter. Now, this is a type of ionization chamber that has coaxial electrodes. So one electrode is cylindrical and forms the inner wall of the tube, whereas the other one is a wire that runs down the middle. And this is designed specifically so that when a particle passes through the gas inside the chamber, it unleashes what's known as a Townsend avalanche, which is a chain reaction where ions create free electrons and free electrons create more ions and so on, and it creates a very powerful electric pulse. And that's the click that you hear when a Geiger counter goes off. And the advantage of this is that even a very low energy particle can trigger a strong signal. Now, what this doesn't allow you to do is actually measure the energies of the particles themselves. So this led to the later development of what's known as the proportional counter. And then later, another development was the scintillation meter. And a scintillation meter works on the very similar principle to a spintharoscope in that there is a crystal inside that, like zinc sulfide, reacts to a particle passing through it by producing a little flash of light. And then you have a photomultiplier tube and an amplifier circuit that takes that tiny flash and amplifies it into a measurable signal. So, there you have it. Not only a history of the spintharoscope, but also a brief history of radiation detectors. Now, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and tune in next time for another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities. We'll be looking at yet another fascinating artifact, just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.